Welcome. I'm Dr. Emma Katz, Associate Professor in Sociology at Durham University and author of the book Coercive Control in Children's and Mothers' Lives. Today we'll be talking about coercive control and parental stalking. Feel free to email me at the email address you can see on the slide there and to follow me on Twitter. In this talk, we will examine what coercive control is, what motivates perpetrators, and what tactics perpetrators use. We'll explore how coercive control harms children, how perpetrators who use stalking as part of post-separation coercive control harm children, and why we need to centre the experiences and rights of children and make greater efforts to tackle perpetrators. Where there's coercive control, the lives and the freedoms of the victims are seriously limited. Coercive control is a largely adult male perpetrated and severe form of abuse where a perpetrator subjects their partner and family members to persistent and wide ranging controlling behaviour over a long period of time. Behaviour that far exceeds the reasonable expectations that people have of each other in families and relationships. And, crucially, they make it clear to the victims that standing up for themselves will be punished. So the perpetrator sets up a situation where it's very clear to the victims that they have to do what the perpetrator says or else they'll face unreasonable and cruel punishments. The punishments may take many forms. It might be violence, but it might not be. But it will be something that the perpetrator knows that the victim dreads, such as cruel verbal put downs, frightening behaviour, sleep and food deprivation, or hurting their loved ones. By repeatedly punishing the victim for non compliance, the perpetrator intends to demoralise and terrorise the victim and victims into a state of permanent obedience. The perpetrator is motivated by their deeply held and harmful drive to obtain control over the other people in their family and to maintain that control for as long as they want it, whether that's five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. For perpetrators, this drive is so strong, it tends to dominate their whole life. Much of their time is spent pursuing the control that they seek and cultivating a positive public reputation that will reduce the likelihood that anyone will ever believe or rally around the victims should the victims come forward and ask for help. So that time that the perpetrator spends telling the people in their community what a great person they are, telling people online what a great person they are and building a positive public reputation that is all part of their ability to keep control of you indefinitely. The impacts on the family will include fear, confusion, self-doubt and self-blame. What am I doing that's causing this? Is this my fault? Why do they treat me this way? There must be something I'm doing wrong. This must be my fault somehow. Low self-esteem, feeling really terrible about yourself. Trauma, PTSD, depression, anxiety, physical illness, because the amount of stress and strain that this puts on the body makes the body much more vulnerable to physical illness. Deprivation, social deprivation, economic deprivation, the feeling of always walking on eggshells, trying to please the perpetrator, doing your very best to keep the perpetrator happy and contented, and not being able to exercise self-determination over key areas of their life. There may also be attempts from victims to fight back. Some victims fight back physically, they hit back at the perpetrator. Some fight back verbally by calling the perpetrator nasty names in retaliation for what the perpetrator is doing to them. And some might fight back in a more subtle way um, by, for example, refusing to think about something in the way that the perpetrators demanded they think about it. 
but there will be attempts at resistance, whether covert or overt, and there'll be increasing attempts to speak the truth about what's happening, protect themselves and other victims in the family from further harm. Here we can see a list of abusive tactics that I believe are part of coercive control. And you can see in the corner here this little graphic of a toolbox which I've named the terrible toolbox. And these are the tools that the perpetrator uses to take a person who is autonomous, has their own needs and rights and preferences and wishes and goals, has a full set of human rights, and take that person and break them down so that they live their life just to please and serve the perpetrator and are no longer living for themselves. So in order to do that, because that's a pretty difficult thing to do, to turn somebody into in, who's fully autonomous, who has a full set of human rights into your own personal servant-like figure who exists to please and serve you. The abuser needs a lot of tools to do that because it's a tough job. So imagine that everything that is on this list is part of the perpetrator's tools to, to accomplish this. The emotional and psychological abuse and the manipulation, including times of rewarding you for being obedient to them, giving you little treats and rewards when they're pleased with your level of obedience. That, you could imagine, is the hammer in the toolbox. The control of time and movement, the micromanagement of your everyday life is the screwdriver. The sexual coerciveness, rape, paranoia about infidelity, intimate image and video abuse and reproductive coercion. That is making you have a child that perhaps you didn't want to have or not have a child that perhaps you did want to have. That's the wrench. And then Imagine that the rest of the list are further tools in the toolbox. Economic abuse, in interfering with the survivor's employment, preventing them from having money and assets in a fair and equal way in their name. Refusing to contribute to bills, creating debts for which the survivor is liable. Isolating the survivor from sources of support, their family, their friends, their communities and the professionals who might be able to help them monitoring, harassing and stalking, including using technology to carry out your stalking. Manipulating others, including children, to upset, marginalise and disempower the survivor. Using legal and institutional means to threaten, harm and discredit the survivor, such as making false reports about them or dragging them back to court over and over and over again. Using, um, using physical violence. So some perpetrators use physical violence. They will physically attack you. Others might not actually lay hands on you, but they will physically abuse you in ways that harm your body. For example, they might deprive you of sleep all the time. They might stop you from managing your medical condition or your disability properly, leaving, leaving you unable to, to manage that correctly. They might um, interfere with your ability to eat a nutritious diet or meet your hygiene needs in the way that you wish to. There may be intimidation and threats, so behaving in a very violent way towards the furniture around you, getting right up close next to your face, hitting the wall next to you, um, making threats of what they're going to do to you. Um, there may be um, threats and intimidation and actual violence towards your pets, your other loved ones, and also damage to property, smashing up your stuff, um, destroying things that are important to you. All of this is continual, not episodic. Evan Stark's book, Coercive Control, How Men Entrap Women in Personal Life, argued that our response to coercive control based domestic violence is failing victims because it's wrongly seeing domestic violence as discrete incidents or episodes of violence. And virtually all of our domestic violence research and intervention is based on this model. But this overlooks that coercive control perpetrators are using many other tactics besides physical violence. They're using emotional abuse, they're monitoring you, isolating you, stalking you, economically abusing you, 
and perpetrators are doing these things continuously. Victims and survivors are therefore being constantly abused, even if there's not been an incident of physical violence for months or ever. So now let's start to think about the impacts of this on children who are going through this in their families. Childhood should be a time of nurturance and growing independence. The intrepid child, supported by loving, empathetic, consistent and boundary setting caregivers, should be able to explore their world. As children get to know themselves and their preferences, their rights, as enshrined in the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child, should be respected, including their rights to have a say in matters that affect them and for their views to be given due weight. Yet perpetrators of coercive control are catastrophically unequipped to give children the childhood experiences they need. A perpetrator who is usually, though not always, a child's father or father figure, and in rare cases can be the child's mother or mother figure or another family member. But for the most part, we're talking here about the child's father or father figure. They are singularly focused on one thing. Their campaign to control their target or targets, who is usually the child's mother and sometimes also the child themselves. In some families, children experience the perpetrator rigidly and malevolently controlling their daily activities, excessively controlling and limiting their contact with friends and family, hurting their beloved pets, and depriving them of access to money and resources that are normal for their age. Coercive control perpetrators don't tend to respect their partner's decision to end the relationship. So while victims are seeking freedom from abuse and to regain their basic autonomy, the perpetrator is typically continuing in their efforts to control and dominate their ex-partner and children's lives and or to punish them for daring to break free. So perpetrators will use children in their post-separation coercive control. A 2007 study by Bieber et al found that most women report that their assailants use their children to stay in their lives, 70% of women reported that, keep track of them, 69%, harass them, 58%, and intimidate them, 58% of the women in the study said that. Almost half of the women in the study reported their assailants had tried to turn their children against them, while 45% reported that their assailants had tried to use the children to convince them that they should take him back. 44% stated that their assailants had tried to use the children to frighten them. Women who had ended or were ending their relationship with the assailant experienced the abuser using the children significantly more than did women who were continuing in the relationship. So this is something that gets worse post-separation, not better. Very similarly, a much more recent study by Clement et al. in 2021 found, again, abusers using the survivor's children to stay in their lives, 76% reported this, intimidate them, 72% reported it, keep track of them, 72%, harass them, 71%, or frighten them, 69%. Many also tried to turn the children against them, 62%, or use the children to convince the survivors to take them back and resume the relationship, 45%. The study's quantitative analysis found that perpetrators' use of the children as part of the campaign of coercive control was worsening the survivors' PTSD and anxiety symptoms. The findings of the Academy of Finland funded CAPS project on children's experiences of parental stalking align with and enhance what we know about the harmful impacts of coercively controlling fathers and, um, and what, what these impacts are on the children post separation. Monitoring and stalking are key tactics used by coercive controllers, which is why it's so important to link coercive control, domestic abuse and stalking together. 
Children experience their father's stalking and are subjected to the same impacts as the adult coercive control victims. The children experiencing this are fearful, they're distressed, and their lives become greatly limited and shrunken, like this, by the abuser's actions until the child's life is really, really small. They can't go where they want to go. They can't do what they want to do. They're always in fear of what will happen, um, whether they, whether their father will say or do something that's really scary, that's really distressing. The impacts are so similar that child victims should be considered victims in their own right alongside the adult victims. So this picture is an illustration from the CAPS project illustrating some of the CAPS findings. And here we can see a child in the centre of the picture and what the child's life looks like from the child's point of view. And we can see the perpetrator saying to the child, I'll give you 10 euros if you take pictures of your mum and send them to me. We can see the perpetrator saying to the child, I'll be coming over to have a chat. We can see that the child here is trying to play, but they're being they're feeling very scared. Even the bush that then they're playing next to looks evil and sinister and like it's watching them because they never know when their father might be watching them, whether he might be hiding behind that bush. There's fearfulness clinging to their mother. There's so many messages, 12 messages, um, you know, letters. There's question marks. There's the smiley face and the frowny face here because you never know what mood the perpetrator will be in. Will this be a day where they're pretending to be nice, where they treat you to things? when they lavish attention upon you and expect you to be really comfortable and enjoying their attention, despite how scary they find you? Or will this be a day when they're just downright terrifying? And you can see the spider's web. You can see the fish that's about to be caught on the fishing hook. So children worried about traps, worried about being trapped. And you can see the telephone with the, with the cross through it because the telephone has become a really scary thing. Although domestic abusers have a playbook of common behaviours and tactics, their coercive control is always tailored to some extent to what the abuser thinks will work best in any given situation. So coercive control is based on long-standing patterns of abusive behaviour and victims become attuned to the particular signs of threats and danger. And these may look somewhat different from abuser to abuser. Therefore, the victim's reactions to particular words or even looks or actions from the abuser. These may seem like overreactions to outsiders who do not understand the history of the abuse. So getting a text message and the child suddenly becoming very scared about that, that might look like an overreaction to someone who doesn't understand the history of the abuse. But the child may get text messages that are highly abusive from the perpetrator very frequently. And words like, I'll be coming over to have a chat, can carry a menace in a way that outsiders may not understand unless they're willing to learn about the history of the abuse. So for all people who, are, who are, have such a child in their life, ask them why they're reacting that way in a gentle and non-judgmental way and what meaning this particular behaviour from the abuser has perhaps what's happened in the past when the abusers behaved that way or said that or looked like that, why this is scary to the child. Try to understand it from their point of view. Because they're not being unreasonable, they're being very reasonable based on the very particular patterns of behaviour that they have long experience of from this abuser. Perpetrators use children as part of their stalking, including their technology facilitated stalking, and this is a global problem. Here's an example from an Australian study. Aoife, a mother, gave a detailed description of how her ex-partner involved their daughters in technology facilitated abuse. During the relationship, he expected to have access to Aoife's phone, obsessing over details of her phone calls. She began to thwart this behaviour by changing her passwords. When she refused to provide her new password, the abuser moved on to the daughters, pressuring them to provide the new password. 
As Eva explained, I started putting a new passcode on, and then if he couldn't get into my phone, he would ask for the passcode. If I didn't want to give it, that would start a huge fight, because of course, she's resisting his control. He won't tolerate that, so he starts to become aggressive. If I didn't give it, he would go and demand to my two older girls, do you know mum's password? Give me the password. So yeah, it would just get into a whole argument. He said to our daughter, you're nothing but a sneaky bitch, because she wouldn't give him the password. Perpetrators can attempt to enrol children as photographers documenting their mother's life, providing a continual stream of photographic data to be used by the abuser as a weapon against her. As one mother explained, he asked the children to take photos of me and my friends and what I'm doing. All the messages he sends to the children have nothing to do with the children, but he tries to exploit the children in order to get information about me. And this is from a Finnish study. Also from the, the Finnish study that's part of the CAPS project, mothers spoke about the emotional toll caused to children by perpetrators continued and excessive contact with them. I'm most distressed because he sends inappropriate messages to the children. At times, both of the children have been emotionally and behaviorally disturbed because of his phone calls and messages. The children don't always have the energy to reply to his messages, which makes the father nervous about it. He then starts to extort the children saying, if you don't answer me, you won't get what I've promised to buy for you. In the examples that we've just seen in the previous few slides, perpetrators were subjecting children to classic coercive control. Coercive controllers often gain their victims' compliance through frightening systems of punishment and reward. If you stand up for yourself, if you put your feelings and needs first and you don't comply with the perpetrator, then you're punished. If you do comply and you do something that makes you feel uncomfortable and you do something that's really against your best interests, then you're rewarded. And how confusing and distressing is this for any human, but especially for a child to be constantly punished for doing the right thing and rewarded for doing the wrong thing. In the previous examples, this is what these perpetrators were subjecting their child victims to asking the children to do things that they were uncomfortable with and that were against their best interests, such as replying constantly to the perpetrator's abusive messages, sending the perpetrator lots and lots of pictures of their mother that would compromise their mother's safety and would give the perpetrator materials to start weaving lies and false accusations out of, um, to, to, give their, to give their dad their mum's password so that he could obsess over her phone calls and further monitor and restrict her. Um, so this is what these perpetrators were subjecting these child victims to and of course the children were distressed and fearful at being punished for doing the right thing and being rewarded for doing something that was against their best interests. The abusive behaviour of perpetrators towards ex-partners and children could all too easily be dismissed in many different ways and too often our societal responses are to dismiss this in many different ways. So just a few examples of how this could be commonly dismissed. A child might say to another child, yeah, my dad can be unreasonable too. Or he's just doing it because he cares what happens to his family. Or the adult victim and survivor might be told, you broke up years ago, why are you still so anxious? Or at least he doesn't live with you anymore, it can't be that bad. Or if you gave him more information yourself, he wouldn't have to try and find out in this way. All of these dismissive and indeed victim blaming and perpetrator excusing responses fail to grasp the full scale of the harm that the perpetrator is causing in the mother and child's life. They fail to view the child's life from the child's perspectives with the child's experiences and their rights to freedom and safety centered. So professionals encountering children in these situations should center the child and the child's rights to freedom and safety from abuse and allow the child to explain what their world looks like and feels like from their point of view and what would help them to realize their rights. To 
conclude, it is often assumed that a father cannot possibly be that dangerous to their own children. Abusive fathers use positive societal sentiments about the importance of family, that children need both parents, discourses about men's orientation towards protecting and leading their families to cloak and hide their terroristic abuse of women and children. Separation is presumed to bring about safety from domestic abuse and violence. So people engaging with a child whose mother and father separated years ago may not understand the extreme level of abuse the abusive father is still subjecting the mother and child to. Technology is enabling abusers to terrorise, terrify and dominate their victims' lives from afar. They don't need to be in close proximity to do this. These crimes by fathers are a violation of children's rights as set out in the UNCRC and are profoundly harmful to children's safety, health, well-being and their ability to succeed in life. As societies, we need to make urgent progress to curb the ability of these abusive fathers to continue with their abuse. So this is my book, Coercive Control in Children's and Mothers' Lives, published by Oxford University Press in 2022, available on Amazon. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Dr Emma Katz of Durham University. Feel free to email me and follow me on Twitter. These are the references that I used in today's talk, which I'll just briefly show you in case you want to follow up on any of them.